Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'd like to start by thanking the Bibliographical Society of America for this honor and for inviting me to present my research. I especially would like to thank Barbara Heritage, Erin McGurl, who goes above and beyond, and Jana Dagdagan for the behind the scenes preparation, patience, and hours of work to make this a successful event. Please note that in this talk, I will use the Western Armenian transliteration system, orthography and pronunciation without the di diacritical marks. Decorative initials sit at the intersection of paleography and art history. A letter form by its nature falls under the paleographical study of a manuscript, yet decorative initials are often disclassified under art history and their scholarship in manuscript studies is often overshadowed by their famous cousins, the miniature illuminations. In this paper, I study all the decorative initial in the Galatzor Gospels from a paleographical lens. And I argue that bibliographical methods can bring together questions raised by paleography and art history for the analysis of decorative initials as more than mere decorations, but as the symbolic aesthetic intervention of letters in dialogue with the exegesis of the text and the potential emergence of a unique genre of paleography. Before delving into the Galatzor Gospels and the Bird Letter initials, I will provide a brief historical background about two important events, the adoption of Christianity and the invention of the Armenian alphabet, which would provide the basis of the veneration of the letters in the Armenian manuscript tradition, particularly in the Gospels and the use of the unique birth letter initials situated within the context of the larger tradition of the medieval Armenian manuscript culture. Due to its geographic location, Armenia is often described as the nation at the crossroads between the East and the West. This fact served both as a catalyst of rapid cultural changes and artistic influences due to the exposure or submission to different empires, such as Roman, Byzantine, Persian, Arabic, Mongol, and Seljuk. It also served as a thorn on the side of the nation due to the endless invasions, pillaging and destruction of cultural heritage material, among which the loss of thousands of manuscripts. Before the fourth century, Armenians were pagans. St. Thaddeus and St. Bartholomew, the two of the 12 apostles of Jesus brought Christianity to Armenia in the first century. Historical sources describe the spread of Christianity as a gradual and organic process when new converts were persecuted for centuries, including in Armenia. However, in the cultural history of Armenians, the tradition of the conversion was inspired by a divine intervention. While terribly ill, King Dirtat the Great's sister has a vision where an angel appears and states that Gregory is the only person who can cure the king and that he needs to be released from the pit or the dungeon, Khordira. Gregory, who was imprisoned in that pit for 13 years for the crime of converting to Christianity, cures King Dirtat the Great from his ailment. Consequently, Dirtat converts and declares Christianity as a state religion, making Armenia the first nation to officially adopt the Christian faith in 301 Common Era. Although Gregory was well-versed in Syriac and Greek, the languages of the church and the Bible at the time, Armenians did not have a written tradition. The oral tradition was not enough to solidify the Christian faith because lay people could not understand the scriptures. Therefore, there was a real danger that Armenia would fall back into paganism. It will take a century before Mesrop Mashtot, an archivist in the court of the king turned into a monk who was fluent in Greek, Syriac and Aramaic will invent the Armenian alphabet in 405 common era which will make it possible to translate the Bible from the Greek Septuagint into classical Armenian called Kurapar, which is the equivalent to that of Latin or classical Greek. Parallel to the events of the conversion to Christianity, historians have traced and presented accurate detailed accounts about how Mashtots traveled and consulted the scribes and worked out the script of 28 consonants and eight vowels that rendered all the nuances of the phonetic sounds of the Armenian language. Yet again, in the Armenian tradition, it is through a divine intervention that the letters came to be. The story goes that while Mesro was struggling to find the perfect letters and praying, in an awake vision, God's hand came down and inscribed the letters on a stone, just like it happened to Moses on Mount Sinai when receiving the Ten Commandments. Therefore, it is at the crux of the conversion to Christianity and the invention of the Armenian alphabet both transpired under the ethos of divinity, 
upon which the Armenian tradition of gospel manuscript illumination sits. When were the first decorative initials used in Armenian manuscripts? There is no definitive established date due to the loss of thousands of manuscripts during invasions. However, scholars agree that soon after the invention of the alphabet, manuscript production started. And if not fully decorated, at least the practice followed the Western tradition of enlarged capitals with basic color schemes. Few examples from the earliest surviving Armenian manuscripts illustrate this point. In this undated manuscript known as the Gospels of Jerusalem, we can see large and thick rounded onsial letters, yergatakir, which means iron forged letters. The examination of the oldest Armenian manuscript in North America, known as the Gospels of Translators dated 966, reveals a peculiar style of initials with abstract figures resembling bird feathers looped in the tails of the long descenders, which could be considered the beginnings of the evolution of the decorative initials in the Armenian manuscript tradition. And I would argue specifically the evolution of the bird letter initials. The marginalia throughout the text is also worth mentioning. In addition to crosses, geometric shapes, and abstract flora, birds are the most prominent. The combination of the divine letter in the divine book of the gospels explains the reverence the decorative initials occupy in the Armenian manuscript culture. These are not mere letters that are decorated. These are spiritual symbols that have become the letter. The divine letters of the alphabet of Mashtots marking the opening of a divine pericope or the incipit of each gospel book. These letters are the representation of the coexistence of the divine and the human, the two natures of Christ, as we will see in the Galator Gospels. This exquisitely illuminated manuscript, dubbed the jewel of Armenian manuscripts, is one of the golden gems of the Department of Special Collections at UCLA. It was executed between 1300 and 1307 common era and completed in one of the most important Armenian monasteries at that time named Galatzor, situated in the upper Northeast corner of Armenia proper. Galatzor was more than just a monastery. It was an intellectual center and boasted a renowned university. Intellectual pursuit is essential to understanding the iconography of the Galatzor gospels. This was a time under the Mongol rule when branding the Armenian Christian identity and setting it apart from both the Eastern Orthodoxy and the Roman Catholic was of utmost importance. The manuscript measures 24 by 17 centimeters consisting of 584 pages, 26 choirs made up of very fine vellum. The color palette is mostly gold and vivid polychrome making this manuscript a luxury item. The text, a complete copy of the four gospels in classical Armenian is legible throughout and was produced for an important ecclesiastical figure. Executed in two stages and two distinct workshops with an unknown length of interrupted time between the illuminations, this eloquent manuscript is the work of two scribes and is luxuriously illuminated by five painters of whom four are unknown. UCLA acquired the manuscript from the late Dr. Garo Minasian in 1968. In their exhaustive analytical and comparative study about the Glatzor Gospels published in 1991, the art historian Thomas Matthews and the late professor of Armenian and Near Eastern Studies of UCLA, Avedis K. Sanjan, present us with a detailed monograph about the provenance, the archaeology, the iconography, and the historical setting of the manuscript. Despite the veneration of the divine alphabet in the divine book, the subject of the decorative initials is curiously neglected and only occupies a paragraph or two in this monumental study, which ascertains the research value of this manuscript as a rich primary resource that we return to time and again, although it has been rigorously studied and analyzed. In the Galatzor Gospels, there are only two types of decorative letters, the ornate letters to your left, these are large tubular letters, and the bird letters called Turchnakir in Armenian. The rest of the initials in the manuscript are all standard capital letters in gold. This is something I love about the bird letters, a tradition that is unique to the Armenian manuscript culture and its decorative practices, and it is ubiquitous in this book. Note the letter J on your right, which has two diagonal strokes and a base stroke. Look how the pose of the bird forms the letter. The letter is not decorated. 
the bird becomes the leather, is the leather. To put this into perspective, let's look at the breakdown. The percentage of birth initials to ornate initials demonstrates the importance and the uniqueness of the use of birth letters in the gospels compared to other zoomorphic figures. More importantly, the absence of other zoomorphic initials is noteworthy. One could interpret the choice of the illuminators to include only birth letters as having a symbiotic meaning with the spiritual interpretation of the canon table birds. The altar commentaries of doctors of the church, such as Nerses Shinorali, explain the symbolic meaning of the motifs and the birds of the canon tables. For example, the peacock is the symbol of the pure nature of angels. Birds with red beaks symbolize the evangelists. These interpretations were not to dictate the artists on how to decorate, but to inspire the faithful to read the motives as spiritual symbols. Not all birds in the canon tables are realistic. Some are fantastical. Therefore, do we assign meaning to the choice of the bird in the bird letter initials for each pericope? Was it the principal scribe's intention when designing the layout of the manuscript, or was it left to the illuminators to decide? These are questions that need further research. The only other zoomorphic initials used in the gospels are the evangelist symbols on the incubit pages, the lion, the eagle, and the ox. There are three types of bird letters in the glottal gospels, single birds representing 15 letter forms, double birds representing 10 letter forms, and triple birds representing only two letter forms. There are uh, 11 letters of the alphabet that do not appear as decorative initials in the glottal gospels. As we can see in this Venn diagram, there are four letters in single and double bird categories. The letter Z is in both double and triple bird formation. The letter A is only in triple birds, and no letter is represented in all th three bird categories. And there is no overlap between single bird and triple bird letter categories. This is where the intersection between art and paleography gets exciting. Is the letter form informing the painter or the scribe to choose the number of the birds? Could we analyze the shapes of the letter forms and assign a paleographical hand within the artistic hand? Let's examine the top four bird letters, which three of them are vowels and one is a phonetic vowel. Here we have the letter E. It has a long descender, ascender and descender, and a large curve, which serves well for the shape of a beak. As we can see, this is formed of a single bird. Here we see a very peculiar two bird formation of the same letter, one on top of the other. This letter could also be represented in three bird formation. This phonetic vowel he, which is pronounced H, is only represented with double birds. Here, the shape of the letter with two large curves renders itself to two bird composition. It is hard to imagine this letter in a single bird formation. Moreover, in the canon table commentaries, birds with intertwined necks symbolize the unity of the Old and New Testaments. This is the letter A and sounds like A. Ah. It appears seven times with triple birds. The shape of this letter with two large ascenders and the base stroke is perfect for a triple bird script. It could be written with only two birds by extending the tail of the bird on the, on the right, but it is hard to imagine this letter in a single bird formation. With a total of 118 decorative initials, the letter Yech A is the front runner in overall ornate and single bird categories. This is due to the use of the word and at the beginning of most pericopies, which in Armenian translates as Yev and is written with two letters. Most of the decorated initials and marginal ornaments are attributed to the first painter, also called the canon table painter. The second painter, known as the evangelist painter, is attributed in painting the decorative initials of only the 22nd choir. Thomas Matthews also mentions that the principal scribe himself could have worked on the illumination of the manuscript once he finished copying the text, a situation often encountered in Armenia. Note the similarities of two birds forming the ascender, the curve, and the cross stroke of this letter. Let's reverse engineer and look at the lines disregarding the bird. On the left, you see a straight back and a curved chest as a center. On the right, the curved chest, the curved line is outwards while the back inwards is straight. On the left, the cross stroke has two curves 
while on the right, it's a straight curve. Now, if we take, remove the color and look into the lines, we can see how different these two paleographical hands are. All these initials are attributed to the second painter. However, not the difference of the birds on page 515 to your left and the middle on 517. This skinny bird appears only once in the Galatians or Gospels. And the middle letter is very unique in that it combined elements of the ornate letters and the birds, which you can hardly see here, one bird and the second bird, and the color palette. You, there's no other letter like this in the Galatians or Gospels. Could it be that these are the ones that the principal scribe completed or was there another artist? Once we remove the color, we see a different aspect of the hands as well. Another interesting aspect in the Armenian gospel tradition is the opening lines of the gospels on incubate pages that use only decorative letters. Therefore, the ornate and bird letters are not used only as initials. We have a special treatment of the initial letter on incubate pages, which represents the symbol of the evangelist holding a gospel book and creates a parallel to the evangelist miniature on the opposite page. These letters are the opening words of the gospels with bird letters. What is different and interesting in the Armenian tradition of manuscript illumination is that both the text and the art of illumination were given equal weight to create a harmonious whole, including the symbolism of decorative initials. From the early grammarians in the 16th century to the Armenian pioneers who seriously studied this discipline of paleography, decorative initials and their types were included as paleographical terms. This trend continues until about 1883, after which the ornate initials vanish from the classification and discussion of the paleographic hands, with the late resurgence of mention in 1948. Decorated initials sit at the intersection of paleography and art history. The text of a manuscript would not be complete without the initial letter of a word. A manuscript can be considered complete without ornamentation or miniatures, but with missing letters, the text is incomplete. In the Armenian manuscript studies, there is a need for decorative initials to be studied not only through an art historical lens, but through a paleographical lens in search of emergent qualities, which could potentially lead to a unique genre, paleography of the ornamental script. To this date, a full set of the Armenian bird letter alphabet is framed and hung in homes, sent as Christmas cards, displayed on t-shirts and made ornaments. Thank you.